twiddle. Twiddling our thumbs. Uh, Hello all, in case anyone can actually hear me. Uh, my name's Mark Lackey, I'm the, the, the co-host for the evening, uh, Steph, who I think I can see, I'm not sure if anyone else can see, um, is the other co-host and now our speaker, Bob Musgrave, uh, we'll introduce a little later. I might wait 30 seconds or so and then I'll um, run through a few housekeeping slides and then I'll introduce Bob. He'll give a very entertaining talk and then we'll have a Q&A session at the end. All right, I think I'll make a start. I can see we've got 40 participants, which is excellent. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank our corporate members, corporate plus members, high size, total seismic and bell size, and the corporate members, Southern Geoscience and Santos, um, very valuable for the running of a society. There are obviously volunteers, and there are now our fees we all pay, but the corporate members do a lot to keep the society afloat and running it as a successful version. Um, also, I'd like to thank the various branch sponsors. Um, if you're like me, I look at all the names there and I pick one out I haven't investigated before and Google them. For New South Wales, I especially like to thank GBG Australia for being our sponsor, um, supporting us for the various meetings. And I'm guessing the COVID year and then later on in 2021, the non-COVID year with a bit of luck. Um, uh, housekeeping, um, at the moment there's a Q&A button and there should be a chat button. Either of those will work for typing in a, a question. Uh, at the very end, um, in this case, uh, Steph will read out the question and Bob will successfully answer the, the, the question, but type your questions in there as you think of them and then towards the end, uh, if you're like me, we you want to save all your questions to the very end. Um, upcoming webinars, this has been a, a busy week. This is my second one and there's another one to come tomorrow, but Adam's going to talk about um, Helitem 2. Uh, Megan's going to talk about the Banda Arc and Alison about Auslan and the Tasmanides in September. So um, please um, make sure you're on the list to listen to all those uh, talks. The more the merrier, I think. It's quite been quite an enlightening experience. Um, member benefits. Uh, I'm guessing most people are members. I normally pick out uh, two of these. This time I, I focused on the annual wine offer. That's primarily because I've just had a glass of wine, um, which is quite good. But our exploration geophysics uh, and preview uh, are excellent. Um, our journal and our, our um, members' uh, view and pre preview are quite good. And also just from the academic side of things, um, a lot of research funding and travel scholarships for students to encourage them to become the next generation. So lots of worthy things. Um, I think I'll go to the next slide. And to keep in touch, the monthly uh, newsletters, uh, the website, the Facebook, the Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, YouTube. So this um, presentation by Bob will be um, recorded as of uh, most of the other ones. And if you go to the YouTube channel for ASCG, uh, you can rewatch all the, the speakers we've had throughout the, the year. Now, I think at this point, I should um, stop sharing and let Bob set up um, and chat to myself. But um, for those in the East Coast, we all know Bob. Bob always gives a, a, a very good talk. He's always, sorry, Bob, always um, arm waving and discussing things we've never thought about. He's currently with the Geological Survey. The actual department he's with changes on a weekly basis. So I don't really know what his department is. I assume he'll tell us. But Bob was a graduate of um, Sydney University. He did his honours and his PhD there. Then I think he saw the rest of the world. He went to ANU, somewhere in Wellington, New Zealand, University of Tasmania, uh, ODP with, uh, out of uh, Texas. Uh, and then he, he, got, uh, he slowed down a little. He went to La Trobe University. Then I see he jumped across to Macquarie University as a postdoc fellow. And then he thought, finally, Geological Survey of New South Wales, which he's been there for the last decade or so, Bob. Yes, um, 15 years. 15 years, well, there you go. Sorry, yeah. I, I shouldn't have mentioned that. Um, and he's kindly <laughs> agreed many months ago to give a talk on, on his current research interests on the Macquarie Art. So without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Bob, all yours. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, 
Yes, oh, yeah. that is a checkered history. I have, I'm not a bit of a Jonah. I seem to go around and close geology departments I'm associated with. If you're not aware, the uh, University of Newcastle's department, where I have a laboratory, is in the process of being shut down as well. Uh, if you have an opportunity to protest about that, I recommend you do, because it's yet another one gone, sadly. And geophysics, of course, is uh, getting rarer and rarer. So we need to do what we can to keep it going. Um, I'm interested to see the list of sponsors. I noticed that we are supported by the MoHo. Um, I think we're all supported by the MoHo, so uh, they're very welcome to put some money in. So I'll start on mine. What I thought I'd address is some of the things that uh, I've been interested in uh, really since I joined the Geological Survey. And uh, coming as a geophysicist to a Geological Survey, uh, the role's always interesting. You don't always interact with the geologists as much as you'd like, and they don't always make the use of your material quite that you'd like. And what they do tend to want to use are the short wavelength information, the stuff that represents the near surface. So, you know, you ask our geologists, and the thing they most want from us is a first vertical derivative or a second vertical derivative of TI. That, they think, is exciting. They might maybe think about other things. They might look at uh, what they would call worms, and we might think of being a uh, horizontal derivative, the uh, uh, way of recognising edges, but they really look at the longer wavelengths of the data. They don't think of geophysics as uh, an indicator of the very deep subsurface. And in fact, I constantly have arguments with my colleagues uh, where they'll describe the uh, particular geophysical characteristics of a, a formation, and I'll point out to them that that's actually the characteristics of the stuff underneath that formation. So getting them to think deeper into the system and to think about the implications of the longer wavelength components, either long spatial wavelength or long period of time. And what that says about the middle and lower crust has been a bit of an interesting challenge. And I've found that we've not made some of the interpretations that we potentially could. There's a few ways that I'm interested in this, but one in particular deals with the substrate or the basement of the Macquarie Arc. And the reason I got involved in that was that I, I, some of my early work with the geological survey was modelling, uh, potential field modelling, and I was modelling across the western part of New South Wales, the Coonabri Belt, which is uh, the uh, northeastern side of Kernamona. And as I modelled there, I found that as soon as I went off Kernamona and into the rocks further east, crossing the subduction zone, leaving the bit of continental craton behind, going across the Cambrian subduction zone, going out into what presumably was originally seafloor, I had a big increase in the regional field. I had to accommodate the magnetic contribution of that seafloor. Not surprising, not surprising at all. Seafloor, more, providing you don't stuff it up too much, is very strongly magnetic. It has a high magnetic susceptibility. It also typically has a high Koenigsberger ratio. And if it's warm enough that that resets towards the present field, it's bearing fairly well, you can expect that to contribute even more magnetization in the same direction as the induced magnetization. So you can expect that to have a strong high magnetic signature. And then I shifted my focus across <clears throat> east, further east in New South Wales to what I'm going to introduce you to in a moment, the Macquarie Arc. And lo and behold, it was supposed to be sitting on oceanic crust, but it was a magnetic regional magnetic low. It's local magnetic highs. There's a lot of very magnetic andesite there, as it turns out. But it's sitting in a regional magnetic low, and that got me thinking. And so you're gonna look at the progress of that thinking. So let's see if this is. Oh, there we go. I have to get that on the right screen to make it work, but there it goes. So <clears throat> I always like that. Oh, and I should add uh, just to fill Mark in. We're now called Regional New South Wales, and I believe we will be for at least the rest of this week. So I'll introduce the contents. Just, I don't like big contents pages. So we're gonna do two, three things. We're gonna talk about the competing tectonic ideas of the Macquarie Arc and their implications for what the basement should be, the underlying material. We'll look at the geophysical evidence for what that actually is. And then we'll think about what that means in terms of the tectonic interpretation. And I warn in advance that there will be geochemistry. So what is that disputed territory? Here we have the Macquarie Arc, outlined in these lovely sort of limey greens here, featuring this eastern part of New South Wales. 
It's an Ordovician belt of cal calcaline volcanics, so typical arc rocks. Um, the oldest, until fairly recently, it was considered the oldest was sort of early to mid Ordovician. Uh, the youngest were right at the end of Ordovician, just into the early Silurian. It has this weird relationship with turbidites, with continental derived rocks, which you would expect probably to be all on the, if you like, continent side, on this side. But in fact, they also pop up on the eastern side of the arc and even in places within the arc. And that's been a challenge for years. It still is a challenge. But it's one of the things which prompts lots of debate and lots of uh, irre irreconcilable differences about tectonic interpretation. It stopped being an active arc in the late Ordovician, early Silurian, what we call the Bonambra and Orogeny. And where it gets interesting from a geophysics point of view is it's setting into, if, if we put on a TMI image, have a look at the setting. So the green stuff is the outcropping belts of the arc, or oh, it's a bit more than outcropping, it's also inferred uh, belts of the arc. You can see this in strong magnetic signatures. There's uh, features like this here, which is a Silurian rift. So you see the deep magnetic source underneath, but the shallower stuff is split by a, a much less magnetic Silurian fill. Uh, there are features here, which as it turns out, aren't so strongly magnetic, but Ignore for the moment, or blank out in your mind for the moment, the short wavelength highs. And we'll look at this in more detail later. And as we drop the geology away, what you see is it's actually sitting on a broad low. Now we'll look at it in a moment, we'll see that that is actually different to the rest of New South Wales. These highs, these features here, are the, the, the outcropping volcanics. The deep sources, the sort of things you see in this Silurian trough, are uh, presumably deep volcanic edifices and the magmatic plumbing underneath those. I've got to go back to here, that's right. So, as I said, there is no, um, well, there are a series of consensuses on uh, the, what the Macquarie art is, but they're all local. They tend to depend which state you come from. So, and frequently what university and occasionally who you drink with. So, the one we tend to favour in uh, the Geological Survey in New South Wales is this, this sort of idea. This is going, this is a two-dimensional view, and keep in mind these are all two-dimensional views, looking from west to east, so looking north up the arc, as it would have been in the Ordovician, and here we have subduction going on. And the idea, this is Bill Collins' idea, is that the complexities we see, and I won't get into those, but the, the phases of granite development and the phases of deformation are related to advances and retreats of the subduction zone. So basically that moves in and out, but the system subducts always in the one way. Alternatively, some people think there's been at least a phase of east dipping subduction. So again, west to east, again, two dimensional, but a phase in which the subduction was uh, occurring in the opposite direction. And that of course would have brought the arc towards the continent and, and potentially producing a continental collision and a head, therefore source of orogeny. Then you get a debate coming out of uh, Jonathan Atchison's group and uh, people, um, uh, people Wollongong now and uh, various others have suggested that instead of it being this Bill Collins model up here, the arc is in fact entirely allochthonous, in other words, from outside. So this is an arc which has come in from the Pacific somewhere and moved in and collided with a, with a subduction zone which is always east of And then, you get the absolute radicals who actually originated out of the geological survey, uh, uh, which uh, eventually, Cam Quinn led this idea, eventually Dick Glenn, um, one of our long stand geologists came around to support it as well. I might say I don't. And in this version, the Macquarie Arc isn't an arc. The actual active arc was further out here in the New England origin. And the Macquarie Arc in this version is a back arc. I have some geochemical differences with that, and I'm a, I'm a geophysicist, so if I'm worried about the geochemistry, the geochemist should be terrified. But uh, that is this alternative idea. I haven't got a figure for the next one because there are no figures on it yet, but there are a number of papers coming out just in the last couple of years which are pulling zircons out of uh, Macquarie art material and identifying either um, preserved zircons, or in some cases actually probably magmatic zircons, suggesting that there might have been an earlier Cambrian arc under the Ordovician Macquarie arc. And that's an interesting possibility. 
So I made a point repeatedly there that a lot of those images were two dimensional and that's a real issue. Geologists love cross sections. They are very, very useful. I'm always pleased when they give me one so I can model it and show that it's impossible and can't possibly be represent reality uh, and then gradually guide them to the truth. What they don't think in very well is three dimensions, and they particularly don't tend to think um, of uh, mechanisms for things like subduction uh, in anything other than cross sections. And that's where you run into problems, because if you look at the geophysics in New South Wales, and this is a, uh, this is, uh, let me put it this way, the, the texture in this is a tilt filter of the total magnetic intensity. So it's a, uh, um, it's a, uh, a, a measure of the uh, angle through which the anomalous field moves. So it's a tilt filter on there, which gives that structure. And it's a very nice field with a tilt filter because it's relatively insensitive to depth. It picks up textures, but doesn't uh, only pick up shallow stuff, which ordinary derivatives do. So we can see these curving structures. And that means those simple two-dimensional models don't work. The system must have some sort of more complex element in it and the simplest way of thinking about that is that the curvature is a developed curvature, which grows over time or, or bends an originally straight system. And that's what we call an orocline. And that image basically, when I originally produced it some years ago, uh, got lapped up, particularly by Ross Cayley of Victorian survey. And that led to his development of the Lachlan orocline hypothesis. So two dimensions versus three dimensions. We had those simple models of subduction zones, not so much different from that, but if you account for the curvature, you need to do, you may not need to do exactly this, but you need to do something which causes the arc to change its geometry. And here you can see it's developed this curved geometry. The explanation in Ross Cayley's model is that it involved the collision of a buoyant uh, uh, continental material in the southern part, the Selwyn block, that pinned that part of the subduction zone the rest of the subduction zone continue to retreat and hence roll back. And that, if you do it, you can, these beautiful numerical models of this, uh, that will force a curvature to develop subduction zone retreat southwards. And these structures, these originally more or less linear structures, get wrapped around to produce an auric line. Very nice, very provocative, and it has implications for what the basement to the arc should be. Here's another model, not quite the same as the Oracle model. This was actually, this comes from Chris Ferguson, and this is his attempt to explain those rather strange twin belts or triple belts even of uh, continent-derived turbinites on either side of the arc. And he wants to have the Macquarie arc initially at quite an angle to what it is now. Uh, that actually implies uh, anti-clockwise rotation to get into its current orientation. And uh, that I find very interesting because Terrible though the paleomag from the Lachlan origin uh, is, there is a hint in it of uh, anti-clockwise rotation during the Ordovician. So I rather like that. I like a version of it, put it that way. So what are the implications of all of these models for the basement? Well, the first thing to take into account, and the geochemist will point this out immediately, is that the geochemistry says that the Macquarie arc is interoceanic. The neodymium and hafnium isotopes tell you that it's not recycling material that's sat up in the crust for a long period. It's not what you'd expect if it had passed up through continental crust. It looks like juvenile material, and that would usually imply that the arc developed out in the ocean. In other words, it's not a Cordillera. It's not a South American type arc. And based on that, they've usually assumed that the substrate to the arc, what the arc is physically sitting on, is seafloor. And if it's seafloor, it's more mid-ocean ridge basalt. There was uh, seismic work done in the, uh, the early, the late 80, very late 80s and early 90s uh, by uh, AGSO, as it was in those days. Uh, that was interpreted somewhat um, with, with uh, an enthusiastic eye, put it that way. But it was interpreted and uh, it was also modelled by Nick Doreen. And the model and the, interpret uh, the seismic interpretation and the potential field model were brought together and were cited as evidence that this material, you'll see this stuff here with little wavy shapes, underlying, this is actually the arc sensu stricto, this is a Silurian infill, this is another more mafic part, which is also however arc related. And sitting under all of that is this stuff, 
which you can see is identified here as Cambrian water, Cambrian and Ordish, Ordish and really, morb volcanic rocks. In other words, classic upper seafloor. And everyone seemed happy and that seemed to make a lot of sense. So that's what um, the, this evidence says. The oricline model that uh, Ross Cayley produced, the Lachlan oricline, the bending type model, doesn't actually directly predict the basement. It could be Cambrian four arc, or the four arc to the older Cambrian arc that existed beforehand on the edge of Kernamona, um, which could be anything, but certainly could be oceanic. It could be a continental basement slither, which wouldn't fit in with this interpretation, or it could be more, which would fit in with this interpretation. If there's a pre-existing Cambrian arc, you'd expect that unless, it, you know, if it's substantial volume, so you're looking now at a really, really long-lived arc system, maybe with a hiatus in between, but something that's spanning not 30, 40 million years, but closer to 100. And if that's the case, you'd expect to essentially have more intermediate rocks underneath the intermediate rocks of the Macquarie Arc. So you'd expect an, a bulk intermediate composition in the substrates of the Macquarie Arc. And if it's the back arc model, the one which says this isn't an arc at all, it's a spreading system, then what you'd expect is perhaps a few thin andesites, but overall it should just be a whole lot of back arc basins. So we should see more, even more morb than this implies. Well, now we get into the geophysical evidence and we get into a little issue about what happens when you let geologists get hold of geophysics. First, we'll have a look at where the evidence comes from. The most powerful data set we have on this is the total magnetic intensity. Now, as I was sort of hinting at, we tend to look at the shorter wavelengths in this, but in fact, there is really useful information in the long wavelength total magnetic intensity data in Australia. And in fact, Australia is about the only place where you can actually do this sort of study and be reasonably convinced of the interpretation. I'll talk about why in a moment. So this is our most extensive data set, TMI, but more of that than we've got anything else. Here's a little plug for the Joel survey. We've just released a new merge of company and, uh, and uh, currently available, or sorry, a currently open company data and government data. There will be a little bit more release coming on as our sunset clause opens up more and more company data. Um, my uh, colleague and mate Sam Matthews has put together an algorithm which sorts all of the data for quality and weights it. And there's a cutoff point. Everything that gets above that cutoff has been included in this merge. It's now available. The easiest way to look at it, uh, get access to it and download the images and soon also the actual data sets is to go to the MinView website. So that's hosted on our overall website. There's a link there. Uh, or if you just come from MinView and Geological Survey of New South Wales, you'll find it. And you can get, it, what you see there is a screen image and you'll get access to it that way. The important thing about this, and it's true of all the Australian data sets, is that they're made as of a, a compendium of lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of little postage stamps. But the postage stamps are tied ultimately to the AWAGS surveys, particularly to AWAGS2 which was the Geoscience Australia, Australia-wide airborne geophysical surveys. And that's something we've got, which I don't think anyone else has got. They are ultra long length tie lines. So this is only a little fraction of them. These tie lines, the, the main lines run north south. They are continuous flights across the continent with other more widely spaced east west tie lines. Now that's something that uh, is a remarkably useful thing because it allows you to absolutely tie one uh, uh, merge to the next, one, one grid set to the next, without the issues of getting little DC offsets, which potentially cause problems. I haven't got the image here, but I remember very well the pre, uh, well, it was, I think it was a 1992 version, but certainly the pre-2000 versions from uh, AGSO, as it was in GA, of the Australian TMI image. And at the time I was at uh, La Trobe University teaching there, one of the many universities I've managed to close. And uh, I was teaching geophysics there. I had up on my board their image and Victoria was just deep blue because the process of putting together, merging successive postage stamps of data sets of, of grids had resulted in a DC shift, which had pushed all the Victorian values to very low values and it was not actually realistic. The long wavelength component of that signal was being aliased, it was not correct. When AWACS came in, that went away, and we got a useful 
signal on the sort of, you know, tens to hundreds of kilometres wavelength, which actually tells you something about the lower crust. And in fact, every compilation made since AWACS, as we add more data, remains stable. That was a real game breaker for people like me that want to interpret this sort of stuff. So what does it look like? This is a little compilation of uh, TMI through uh, New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania, a bit of South Australia, a little flavour of Queensland in there as well. And the Macquarie Arc is this bit in here. And you can see it's sitting, and this Thompson is also interesting enough, it's sitting on a long wavelength magnetic low, as is the Proterozoic over here in the Delamarian origin, as is up here the North, the, uh, North Queensland uh, uh, um, craton. Those cratonic areas have long wavelength magnetic lows. That's not that surprising, but so does the arc. And if we do an upward continuation, there's a 20 kilometre upward continuation, it becomes a little more um, explicit, if you like. You can definitely see that long wavelength low that the high wavelength parts of the modern, or modern sorry, Ordovician, hardly modern, but the, long, the, the high intensity parts of the Ordovician arc on somewhat shorter wavelengths are sitting on top of that. Um, one of the things I considered when I was first starting to look at that, this was, oh, maybe it's just uh, variations in the Moho depth. So in places where you've got a low, it's um, uh, sorry, not Moho depth, I'm saying the Curie depth. Uh, to those who don't know, the Curie depth is the depth in the crust at which the geotherm brings the temperature up to the Curie point of magnetite. So you lose your magnetization. And one possible explanation of this sort of character, this feature, would be to say that in places where you've got a regional magnetic high, the Curie depth is lower and it's incorporating more crust. And in places where there's a regional magnetic low, the Curie depth is shallower uh, because of higher heat flow. And so there's less crustal contribution. But in fact, there's been work done on the Curie depth in Eastern Australia in recent years, over there by Tropping and Kennett. And the Curie depth is deep. It's mostly pretty much where the Moho is. So you're seeing the whole crust contribution. So Anything we see here is not just due to a variation in Curie depth. It's actually due to the longer wavelengths are due to variations in the susceptibility of the middle to lower crust. If we did have a more but middle crust under here, it should be a long wavelength magnetic high. Morb is highly magnetic. This stuff here, extending down to Victoria, there are places where these Victorian rocks actually outcrop at places like Dookie and the Heathcote area and they are in fact seafloor and they are in fact more or at least partly more and they are in fact strongly magnetic so having a magnetic high here and extending up here into new south wales under the logger belt isn't surprising having a magnetic low over here under proterozoic rocks isn't surprising but having a magnetic low on an arc that's supposedly sitting on more is surprising so i went back and revisited the potential field modeling here are some images of some of the uh, uh, models that Nick Doreen did many years ago in his paper. They're, they're, they're fine models. Uh, the data were not quite as good as they are now, but there's nothing inherently wrong with the models. Uh, down here is an interpretation built out of a comp compilation of these with the seismics of the geology. Uh, I've redrawn this after stuff that uh, Dick Glenn put together, but you'll notice this deep blue thing here and here. This is this substrate or basement to the Macquarie Arc, and it's identified as Ordovician to Cambrian Moor. We go up to the original models. These things correspond to these various bits of this, uh, uh, these sections here, and the stuff corresponding to that deepish blue is the stuff with the squiggly lines. Body 34 on this model, body 17 here, body yield is at 52 over here. In Nick's original paper, these are given a susceptibility of zero. They have no contrast with uh, the background. However, and Nick didn't call it more. He just called it middle crust, which is good and safe. That's a good thing to do. He didn't call it more. However, when, now if you didn't see that, you might notice that up here, I'm flicking exactly the same sections but this is Nick's original model, and this is what it became in the geological interpretation. You might notice, I'm being cruel geologists here, but I delight in this. You might notice that some of them, some parts which were originally middle crust, 
suddenly change character, become arc. Some things which were arc suddenly become middle crust. That's not so bad. You should never do that. You can't go and change it and keep the anomaly response exactly the same as if nothing had changed, but we'll forgive them that maybe. But here's the kicker. Look at this one. Here's your uh, substrate to the Macquarie arc, mid crusty. And in the geological model, it stays exactly the same, but it's become Cambro, the Cambrian Ordovician Maud. It was seriously changed character. Now, why I bring this up is that that geophysics, that geophysical modeling has been cited over and over and over again as conclusive evidence that the Macquarie Arc sits on more. It's been cited by many geochemists because geophysics has proved it. Yeah, there we go. More battery should be very magnetic. Uh, I've, I've bothered to go and uh, uh, research a lot of actual more sampling, uh, a lot of it from the ocean drilling program, but from other sources as well. Susceptibility is generally greater than 500 by 10 to the minus five. Kernigsberger ratios tend to be greater than two, and if you bury it deeply so it all goes viscous, the field in remnants will point in the same direction as the induction. So you end up with an effective susceptibility of about 2,000 by 10 to the minus five. It's a magnetic rock. So that was the cheating. So I went and had a look at the models myself. I've been asked you know, over the last few years to do a number of potential field models in the uh, either crossing the Macquarie Arc or just reaching into it, uh, connected to our mapping programs. Here's a model, it's first one I'm going to show us, I've just loosely called it the Forbes model, but you can see it's crossing from up here, just north of West Wyalong, across uh, three of the belts of the arc. Well, actually, sorry, no, two of the belts of the arc, it doesn't get into the third one. Uh, it's published, if you want to chase it up, it's a GS New South Wales report. Uh, I will actually publish this as a paper because I think it's a real interesting exercise. The model that I was provided with by the geologists, this was Jamie Robinson's work, was beautiful. It's actually one of the best geological cross sections I've received in the sense that it needed the least modification to get it to work as a potential field model. There were some changes, but they weren't huge. But the most significant part is here. Here is your underlying substrate or basement to the green stuff and the green stuff on the Macquarie Arc rocks. And I modeled that with a density of 2.685 grams per cubic centimetre. That could be up or down a bit, more likely up. Uh, because ridge, trying to set background densities in, in gravity is always a bit tricky, but the susceptibility was limited to the absolute most I could have and make it work was about 400 by 10 to the minus 5 SI. Much, much lower, more than an egg, uh, order of magnitude lower. Uh, is that no, no, sorry, half an order of magnitude lower than what you would expect for MORB. Uh, and in fact, these sort of values match what you would expect from an intermediate composition, they're the sort of values which you would associate with the middle crust below a mature arc with a sort of broadly dacitic sort of composition. And they do in fact correspond nicely to the Zubonin system, which I'm gonna to return to. There's actually, I haven't got a good image of it, but there are models of the Zubonin, or sorry, there are um, uh, magnetic images of the Zubonin arc, which in fact show a long wavelength, low susceptibility, uh, deeper crust, and that's thought to be due to it being a very thick arc. So we've got something underneath there which is not more and is more like an intermediate composition that could be dacite, it could be for that matter, uh, bulk lower continental crust. That's pretty much what the composition of the lower continental crust is. We can't distinguish that geophysically. And if I play with those, if I try and bring in more type uh, properties, up here is gravity, so black is data, blue is model gravity, down here is TMI, black is data, red is model. If I give it more type properties, the gravity goes nuts, but that is not as good to tell because there are ways you can fiddle that. But I cannot, whatever I do, make the magnetics over this area where this feature comes closer to the surface. I cannot make that work with more type characters. Same thing at East Riverina. This is a more recently completed model. I need to improve the lower crust, which is a bit rough looking. But the significant thing there, it cuts across in the Tabarabara zone in Victoria, through the Wagga belt, and across the southern part of the arc, which we call the tumor trough, which is a Silurian extension, but it's got arc bits of rock in there as well. And uh, I haven't done the lower crust in detail, but you need this large contrast, 3,000 by 10 to the minus five on this side, about 200 by 10 to the minus five on that side, to get, you can see, it's subtle, 
but there's this regional low here as opposed to these regional highs. It's a small part of the signal. The amplitude is small, the wavelength is long. That's what you get for having things which are deep below us. If you, again, if you put more type qualities into that, you end up with this sort of problem. It's really, and you, I mean, you obviously you can feel all the geometry in the surface here, although it's you know, reasonably well known, but I can't make it work with more type values. Is there anything else? Well, again, sticking to the theme of long wavelengths, long wavelengths, or if you like, long periods, if we start talking about seismic waves, long wavelength is long period. If you start thinking about um, the long period seismic signal, you start to think about uh, what we've got going on in the lower crust. And we have this wonderful seismic uh, velocity model, OSRIM, uh, developed uh, from the group at ANU. Marvellous thing here, very nice slices of a P or, and also S wave velocity. I've got a P wave velocity slice, which I'm gonna show you in a moment. And as we bring that up, so I'll bring that in, the warm colors, the red colors are low velocity. The greens and blues are high velocity. You would expect high velocities in more, you'd expect lower velocities in continental type crust. Certainly you see, um, uh, you, you, know, you see higher velocities here in what is, this is the, uh, uh, the stall zone, a bit of the Bendigo zone. There's certainly higher velocities here, but in this interval under the Macquarie Arc and corresponding, note the correspondence, corresponding to the blue here in the magnetics, we have low velocities. And there's even a bit of structure in that. Uh, when I first looked at this, it was the first time in geophysics I'd ever actually seen evidence for a thing called the Lachlan transverse zone, which uh, our uh, geochemists love. And there actually does seem to be something there. So. I hope you can see them, it might be real after all, not just imagination. What else have we got? We've got a very new data set, which is the Auslamp Magnetotelluric data set. Uh, not my work, we, we, we're involved in it, of course, with the New South Wales Survey. Um, you're probably aware of this, it's a rolling program of deployment of long period magnetotelluric stations. So, a limited number of them, they roll their way through. Uh, we were well on the way to completing New South Wales when COVID got in the way a bit. That will soon be complete. Uh, certainly you're aware of magnetotelluric. It's a passive electromagnetic technique. Your sources are variations in the, um, in the uh, Earth's magnetic field due to things like uh, on the long period, it's interaction with the, uh, the solar wind. Shorter periods can come down to things like lightning strikes. Those are the source of your signal. It's a passive uh, array. This is a collaboration between the universities, Geoscience Australia and various state surveys, and we're mapping out the conductivity or if you prefer the resistivity of the subsurface. And that conductivity responds to lots of things, as it says here, elevated temperatures, presence of minor conducting phases, partial melt, saline fluids. Many of the things which are associated with cow alkaline arcs, which include lots of sulfides, and lots of uh, somewhat hydrated minerals, and various things like that, they tend to produce more conductive signals. So we might expect an arc to look relatively conductive. Here's the consortium of OzLamp. You can pick uh, your way through there. Uh, all the, uh, I think all the surveys, or pretty much all the surveys, GA, a bunch of universities, uh, central group in ANU, of course. And this is what OzLamp looks like. I will apologize to Alison Coopy, who will be giving a talk in a few weeks. Uh, who will give you, no doubt, the, a more updated version. I, I didn't really have time to modify this slide and bring in the latest version of the data, which includes uh, results from stations further north in New South Wales. But this part still maintains the same general character, and it shows what I need to show. So we're going to look at a series of slices. We won't go all the way to 100 k's, but we'll go from the upper crust, base the upper crust at 10 kilometres, down to the bottom of the crust. And the thing I'll point out to you is that the where you have arc-type rocks, and here's an older Cambrian arc-type rock, there's actually probably a buried one up here as well. You do have conductors associated with them. And certainly the Macquarie Arc seems to have belts of conductors associated with it. If you push down deeper, they're still there. And they're still there. And they're still there. They change geometry a bit, but you don't see them disappear. I don't see any evidence there of a really contrasting basement. So it seems like pretty much the whole cross is occupied by rocks which are broadly, in that sense, similar to the shallower parts of the Macquarie Arc, that are broadly intermediate in composition. Either a very thick mature arc, or a or, or one arc over another, or 
a continental fragment. I can't tell the difference between them. I'll accept the geochemist's argument that it can't be continental. So that means we've got arc and arc and turtles from there down. So what does that mean tectonically? It helps here that we have lots of ages. There's a lot of new dates coming out just in the last few years from Zircon work. So what have we got? Over here on the edge of the croton, we have, and here outboard of the edge of the croton, we've got crunched up flinders behind it, but we have this Cambrian arc, the Mount Wright arc here, the Staveley arc there. This is perhaps a little younger, but it's a Cambrian feature. Very definitely an arc, very definitely, we'd say, there has been argued, but we'd say certainly developed uh, on a west dipping subduction zone on the edge of the continent. And in some models, at least, including Ross Cayley's model, uh, the later Ordovician arc in some way migrated out from there. There's a really interesting feature here in the four arc of that system, what we call the Ponto group. The Ponto group are rather anomalous rocks. They are four arc rocks. Their chemistry is not very typical. It looks more like um, spreading systems, like perhaps a back arc basin. It actually has some very close analogies to things we know from uh, the Canadian Cordillera, where they actually get very similar rocks, as it turns out, in the same setting. But the age is important. They're about 515 to 505. They're just a bit younger. And down here, we have something broadly equivalent, the Magdala sequence of foliites and bonanites, which are similar sort of ages. So probably a little old, here the ages overlap, but I suspect overall a little bit younger here than what they flank, and certainly that's the case there. But these were developing the four arc. Bonanites are very important for the any, uh, if there's a geochemist here, they might tear me to pieces, but I'm gonna presume I'm safe and there aren't. So I'll explain this to the geophysicists. Bonanites are a high uh, magnesium basalt and they result from relatively high temperature melting at subduction zones and they're thought to represent the stage of initiation of a new subduction zone. So down here, we've actually got, oddly enough, there was an old subduction zone there, but it looks like a new one is initiated. Then we have little belts here in Heathcote and the Mount Moreton zone in Victoria. Notice oriented in different directions and those also have bonanite, they also have some andesite in them. And they're similar age, possibly a little bit younger. That geometry there, if you take Ross Cayley's model, this bit here rotates around and that originally would have been straight. So we would have had a belt of these running up here. And then you go a bit further east and you've got, oh, you've got this Ordovician Macquarie Arc. It's a bit of a time gap. Ah, but there isn't. Because there's data coming out now that when I first did this slide, we only had it from here in Kulak. But there's now other Zircon data coming out from other parts of the arc which says that there are Cambrian age arc type rocks sitting underneath this in the Macquarie Arc basement. Hurrah, I say, because that is what the geophysics is. And the, if, if there is ultimately um, more tholeitic rocks underneath there, there's not a lot. They're deep down. They're probably very, very heavily remelted. Uh, given the amount of granite that comes up through this, the amount of heat that's gone through the system, I don't think they'd be terribly intact. But what there isn't is a big slab of lovely intact foliot, as has been generally assumed in interpretations of the arc. And it is quite consistent with this being a long-lived, perhaps in two phases, perhaps continuous system with a Cambrian arc, which retreated rapidly from this margin. And I have some ideas about that and about how that got initiated, which I won't go into in this talk. That gets into the really arm wavy tectonics. And because you can't see me very well, I don't think you can see me at all, actually. Um, you won't see my arms waving enough, so I won't do that. But the important thing there is that we can see this sequence, which youngs towards the east. The younger rocks are over here, but they incorporate stuff which is related to here. There's geochemistry in the Macquarie Arc, which links to the geochemistry of Ponto here. Uh, having the bonanites out on this side of the other arc tells me that the arc system is moving towards the east over time. So how does that fit in? What models actually get through, those models we had initially of what the Macquarie Arc might be, what do that gets through this understanding of what the basin is? Well, it's definitely not a back arc. It would certainly have lots of more, but it's not that. It could be a lothness. It could have come in from far out in the Paleo-Pacific and have nothing to do with the rest, but 
and in that case, it'd be sitting on, um, uh, could be sitting on an older Cambrian arc that started there, out there, would have been an East Sniffing Subduction Zone. But we have this geochemical similarity to rocks which were the Ponto group. I'll just remind you what those were to the rocks here. And we also have the feature that the sequence of bonanites suggests that the system was younging and migrating over, over time towards the east. And that actually fits the Oropine model fairly well. It's not the unique solution that would work, but it does fit that fairly well. I'd suggest with some extra complication, the Oropine model of Ross's really only starts in the Ordovician. He doesn't really consider much before that. I'd suggest that the transition from the Cambrian to the Ordovician involved the rapid retreat of the subduction zone, the generation of a, uh, a backup basin, which included uh, a bonanitic four arc, which then developed a calcalkaline four arc, or sorry, calcalkaline volcanic arc on it, and that became the nucleus of the later Ordovician arc. You see very similar things in modern systems. The Izubonin system is similar, the New Hebrides arc is similar, and in fact, the arc in that case grows laterally over time. So this looks like it has some good modern analogues. And those modern analogues, certainly the, in the case of the Izubonin arc, the geophysics of the Izubonin arc looks similar to the Macquarie arc. The geochemistry, in fact, is very similar. It's a very high potassium arc, and it has this same history of rapid retreat of a subduction from a pre-existing subduction zone, development of bonanite over this new four arc, and then development of a calcalkaline arc on that. So here's the Izzy Bonin analogy. Why do I look at Izzy Bonin? Well, I had the opportunity to go and sit over it for a long time and just drill holes. This was the site of uh, um, the Ocean Drilling Program, or sorry, International Ocean Discovery Program, we get the modern name, uh, Expedition 350, which I sailed on, um, only a partial success. We didn't get as much basement as we'd hoped to. We got an awful lot of mud, which I like because it was good for Paleo Mag. But um, the important point for us is that it, in many respects, in terms of geochemistry, in terms of this relationship between bonanite and later calcalkaline rocks, uh, it resembles in many ways, and even in terms of geometry, it's a bit, the uh, distances involved are very similar to reconstructed uh, extents of the Macquarie Arc system. In many ways, it looks like the Ordovician Macquarie Arc, and I think it's a very good analogy for it. A uh, little more detail on there. This is the origin of the Izubonin Arc. It starts from a rapidly retreating new subduction zone, which, because it's pulling up hot asthenosphere, has these high temperature melts, and that's what gives you the bonanites. And then a calcalkaline arc starts to develop on that. Uh, in this case, this started in the Eocene, it's been going since. This, if you like, is probably a model for the early stages of the Macquarie Arc. If we let Izubonin and go for another 30 or 40 million years, it'll develop an even thicker arc system on top, and it'll look very much like our Macquarie Arc system. And it does have these lovely geochemical similarities, which I'll leave to the geochemists. So the conclusions. The most important one is that the basement of the Macquarie Arc is intermediate in composition. It's not mafic, or at least it's not more. You can have mafic compositions which aren't very magnetic, but you also expect to have high velocities and the velocities are terribly high. The basement is Cambrian in the age. We know that now from these uh, zircon works. So it's probably a Cambrian andesitic arc. That matches the age and it matches the uh, inferences from the geophysics. Given that association of bonanites, which you get in the Bendigo and Tabarabara zone, and they're also dredged just off the New South Wales coast in the Malacuta zone, that looks like that developed behind an earlier phase of bonanitic near trench volcanism, and that's very analogous to the Izu Bonin system. Take from that what you will. Um, but uh, I guess a very good way to study uh, New South Wales is to go to Japan. And uh, when we were able to do so, I might go back. And that is me. I'm out. Um, lots of collaborators, obviously, huge number of collaborators in Auslamp, uh, just the major ones listed there in terms of our publications on this. Uh, Sam Matthews has done a wonderful work, uh, wonderful, diligent and uh, painstaking work in putting together our new uh, uh, TMI and gravity grids. Uh, Jamie Robinson did that wonderful starting model, the reference model for the Forbes profile, which really let me see what was going on. And Phil Gilmore, another of our geologists, gave me a starting model also. Perhaps not quite as detailed, but also very useful for the East Riverina profile. And at that, I'll take questions.
Thank you, Bob. Um, for those posing their questions, please type them into the Q&A or the chat. All right. You got them there, Mark? I think, uh, yes, I think you got in soon. Uh, all right. First one is um, for me and Roach. He just says, hi. Oh, uh, and then oh hi, Yvette. Yvette. <laughs> uh, And then Yvette, she says, uh, great to see use of the A-Wags in the New South Wales uh, GMI so compilation. It's the A-Wags, Wags the dog, yes. Yeah. Uh, and then I can see one from Richard Blewett, I think. Oh, yes. um, good name. Yep. Yep. The assumption here is that the geometry is true and the rock properties are a variable. Could the geologist be guessing the architecture? Uh, the, <laughs> the answer is yes, although <laughs> there is seismic control, right? So uh, the architecture is not unreasonable. Um, the uh, the uh, Nick Doreen's original model was based around uh, seismic sections. Uh, my remodeling there also takes those seismic sections into account. So at least partly the geometry is controlled. Yes, you can start to do other things, but it's it's hard. You know, if you're going to do long, look at the long wavelength field, um, you've either got to have big changes deep down or you've got to have an even, you know, very tenuous systematic changes shallower. Uh, I've actually seen, I'm not the first person to notice this, in fact, Chris Clopike, uh, my slightly crazy paleo mag friend, uh, noticed exactly this in, in, he had a paper which had some really interesting ideas about Eastern Australian geology, but he ascribed the low to a remnants anomaly. He said it was all remagnetized remnantly during the Permian. Um, I think that's really hard to do. Anything which, where the source is relatively shallow, whether it's uh, an, a, a, an anomaly due to low susceptibility or it's an anomaly due to reverse magnetization, um, tends to have a lot of character to it. You can you, you can simulate a deep source with a shallow one, but the shallow source has to be really uniform. You know, it has to be perfect little ellipse. Uh, deep sources can have a lot more shape to them and you don't see it. Uh, so I find it difficult to produce that uh, magnetic low in any way other than to have the mid to lower crust relatively low susceptibility. All right. Um, Cameron... Ken says the Stavely arc may go back to 520 to 525 MA. Yeah, that'd be good. I'd be yep. happy with that. Yep, yep, yep. That works better. Uh, Regis Neroni, Bob, you have not mentioned gravity data at all. Why is that? If because gravity coverage really <laughs> is the a limitation. The gravity is, the, is all the bloody granites. <laughs> granites, are, you know, I just said, you know, you can alias a deep source by a shallow extended source. What's a granite? It's a shallow extended source. A lot of our granites are pretty pancakey. You can actually see similar things in the gravity, but combination of the granites and the base and the basins uh, really make it hard to be certain. I can sort of talk. Remember, I mentioned that, that I, I can uh, uh, for one of those profiles I showed the Forbes profile. I won't bother going back; it's too far back there. But one of the profiles I said it goes wildly wrong if you put these higher densities in. But I conceded that you could probably make it work because a it's really hard to know what the genuine regional is for gravity. It's always really tricky to set. And you can always whack in basins and you can always whack in flying granites. And in, in especially in, in New South Wales, west of the Great Divide, there are a lot of basins. There are a lot of blind granites that don't actually outcrop or have been mapped. And uh, I'm much less confident about interpreting it. I, I don't see anything in the gravity that's inconsistent with that. I just I don't regard it as being a convincing argument. The mag, I think, is a lot more convincing, and certainly the seismic velocity is more convincing. And the M2, I'd say, too. And Regis, for the second half of the question, says, what about all that beautiful satellite-derived gravity data? Is anything useful? Very there? long wavelength. Basically. Yeah, you can. I've actually have, I have had a look at it. Uh, and again, I, I make the same argument. It's a little hard to extract out how much of that is just due to all that bloody sand out in western New South Wales. I mean, some of our basins out there are multi-kilometre thick. So... You know, all you've got to have is a, is you, you change, you whack an extra kilometre on the uh, the basin, uh, you know, get to the basins, or you just make, you, you change the densities in the basins a bit. Um, I remember modelling the Bankania Trough, which had been modelled as standard Darling Basin at about 2.4 to 2.45 grams per cubic centimetre, 
and I found hidden away, misfiled as it was, as it were, or as it, as it turned out to be, um, actual measured density data from that basin. And the basin sediment fill was actually much denser, about 2.55. So that suddenly changed how you modelled that. So um, it's there, it's, it's worth looking at, but um, I, I don't use it as a convincing part of the argument because I can't convince myself. Right, eh? Oh, um, Richard adds, but you've told us that geos were courageous in their interpretation. Yeah, <laughs> yes, I courageous. That. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're certainly able to to, um, to charge on against the jibs of all the evidence without uh, worrying about the slings and arrows. Uh, the um, look, I I, um, I I understand. The, the disconnect, I think that unfortunately there's much more disconnect between the geophysicists and geologists that I would like to see. And uh, it goes both ways to a certain extent, but I would always counsel people carefully. If they look at a geophysical interpretation of some geophysics, just make certain it actually matches the geophysics. Uh, don't trust them. Uh, do you want to take a few questions, Deb? Sure. Um, okay. So, um, Ian again says, uh, not a question, but a comment. So it's nice to see the story about the Lachlan Fallback Fall Belt coming together. As a student last century, there were so many ideas from such sparse data. This work seems to confirm the Oracline model. There has been another proposed for Southern Queensland. Does your data support this? Uh if you talk about the um, the oracline in the the, the um, uh, New England origin, uh, it's not inconsistent. There's a I, I have actually looked at that. We a our mag over New England's crap. It really is bad, uh, which is something I'd love to see is fixed. Um, you're not sort of dealing with an arc there so much. There is a there's a long-standing issue about where the arc in New England origin actually is in New South Wales, whether it's whether it's there's a, a strongly magnetic and dense feature, which is sometimes identified as being the old arc. It's also sometimes regarded as being part of the river system that, you know, the Sydney Gun and our Basin was based on. So, yeah, I'm not so certain about it. Um, does it bear on that? Maybe a little. I guess probably the main thing it bears on is that we should keep in mind the possibility of that sort of four-dimensional complexity, or th sorry, well, they actually four-dimensional, it's times involved, four-dimensional complexity in these arc systems. And the New England... I think everybody agrees it's got been up. The argument then becomes um, just how many oroclinal bends there are and how many might be inherited primary curvatures. Uh, I won't get into that argument now. There's also another one, of course, up in the Mossman origin, which I think is even more convincing. And that one, um, I've, oh, actually, oh, excuse me for a moment, I've got a heater on in here and I'm cooking. So I'm just going to turn it off. <laughs> I've forgotten how room, warm this room can get with the door closed and the heater going for a whole hour. Uh, oof, here we go. Um, oh, there's yeah, there's the there's another oroclinal structure up in the Mossman origin, and uh, there's Palamag out of there from uh, the uh, um, uh, Silurian and Devonian, and it's interpreted as representing a, possibly representing a very large migration of Australia. And in fact, it's probably just turning around in the origin of the oroclinal. I think it bent in that period. So we need to keep, even if you don't believe a word I've said, uh, take away from it that we need to think in this somewhat more subtle, more three-dimensional way about uh, about the Tasmanides. And we've been stuck a lot with cartoons, which are almost always two-dimensional. I, I, I see a few of them where there's a sort of vague effort to make it three-dimensional. They draw a cross-section and then they draw a few sort of islands going off into the distance and that makes it three-dimensional. Well, no, it doesn't, you know. Uh, um, so you really do need to take into account the possibility that things may move very dramatically like that. Uh, my great, um, the thing, I, thing I'm least happy about is that we still don't have decent Pallier Mag out of uh, the Lachlan. Uh, I've had a student trying to work on that problem and bugger it, everything's overprinted. It may be a Devonian overprint, it's a bit hard to tell the difference between Devonian and Cenozoic as it turns out, but we think it's probably Devonian, pardon me. And, uh, uh, that unfortunately is obscuring a lot of what we're trying to see. I'm not giving up. I will eventually get the results out of the Palamag in the Lachlan that do either show it is an oracline or, or boots that all to hell, one way or the other. Okay, thanks for that answer. Um, so Ted says, great science and great presentation, Bob. Um, and then Mike Smith, great talk, Bob. 
It is so important that the Geological Survey New South Wales supports your creative thinking, which will influence future mineral exploration strategies. Listen there, Ned. <laughs> um, so, Jesse Cotterill, sorry for the pronunciation, um, asks, could the turbidites on the eastern flank of the Macquarie Arc not be shed from the arc itself? Thompson uh, Manstone. Good question, but they, they, they've got no arc type detritus. It's, it, they, they really, this is this old idea that goes back to Fons Vandenberg of the, of the, the Great Ordovician Mud Pile. There's this uh, whacking huge amount of really, really bland rocks, which are just basically quartz and the obit of clay. There's not much else in them, and you don't see any arc contribution. There is a very still disputed relationship between the arc and the turbidites. There are people who claim that they've mapped conformal relationships. There are people who claim that that's crap and it's all awful. So you can't be certain what their original relationships are. And that's an argument actually within the geological survey. I mean, our different geologists have claimed one thing or the other. Uh, I've actually tr tried to look at those outcrops myself. Apparently all the really important ones are really, really, really hard to get to. So I haven't got there. Uh, the, the ones I've found, I, I, I can't say. I, I don't see anywhere where I see a clear contact. Okay. Um, so the next question, um, any oh, from Ned, um, any implications for where we should look for the next big porphyry? Are there any new ore generation models we can now consider? That's a good question. And I will hand that to people who are much better and much more knowledgeable about that than I am. I would just say, I think our best analogy in our system, if you're going to wander around and look for analogies, which is what a lot of this is based on, is Ebonin's a good analogy? I've got to say, it's not the most mineralized arc system in the world. It does, it's high potassium and it does have porphyries. Uh, and they're actually some, some, a bit of it, they actually found a bit of porphyry derived mineralized rock uh, in a dredge sample one time. They actually didn't locate where it came from. It was just on the side of a, a seamount. Uh, there's also, I think reasons to think that the arc in the Cambrian at least was probably growing laterally, which is like the southern end of the uh, New Hebrides or the uh, New Hebrides arc, the southern end of Vanuatu going towards the Hunter Fracture Zone. So I guess if you consider what sort of environments you might have there, that might tell you something. Um, but I, I, as I said, um, I, I never dip into trying to interpret all systems. Um, we do know there are, there are certainly porphyries in the Macquarie Arc. There are good porphyries in the Macquarie Arc. We now know the Macquarie Arc almost certainly was active for longer than we previously thought. So maybe we want to go and look at a few more places, taking that into mind. Sounds like we need to do more field work. Um, Mark? Oh, yeah, post-COVID, certainly. <laughs> Mark, I'll let you take the next question because I'm not sure how to say that word. <laughs> what was it really? Yeah. Um, this is from, where did we get to? Uh, to Henry. Uh, Henry Tabar. Good stuff, Bob. How, where do we fit in Shosunitic? That was wrong. Shosunitic magnetism yeah, in central is, is high potassium stuff. Um, Izu analog. There are Shoshanites in the uh, in the Izu Bonin arc as well. That's a. Um, I won't get into the the. Oh, I'm not going to try and explain because I'll get it wrong. Uh, the geochemical significance of Shoshanites, but there are similar features in what I think are reasonable analogs. So. Fair enough. Well, high potassium um, is the fact. I should point out that the, the thing which is analogous is not the um, the frontal volcanic arc of Izubone, and that certainly would, Macquarie Arc would have had one. I'm not certain it's actually all that well represented. I think the Macquarie Arc is notable for being very high in potassium, so that leads up to the Shoshanitic rocks, and that's always been a bit tricky. The Izubone system has this big thing called the Izu rear arc, which is an active arc with different chemistry. And the whole reason for the IODP expedition to drill it is that the chemistry that that has with high potassium content, as, and which is a thing shared with the Macquarie Arc, is closer to what you would expect to make continental crust out of. So there's this long-standing idea that you accrete arcs onto cratons and you make new continental crust. And one of the problems that geochemists, I gather, not one, but what I gather they have problems with, is that the classic idea of the main volcanic arc in an oceanic system is too low in potassium. Potassium contents go up, go up as you move further away from the subduction zone, as the subducting plate gets, that's your sourcing magma from gets deeper, or which is 
modifying the asthenosphere, which is where you source the magnets from, as that gets deeper, the potassium content goes up. Isobonin is notable for having this very large and cu currently still active um, high potassium rear arc. And I think that's probably the thing which is most like the Macquarie Arc. It also has cross arc structures, which is a thing we see in the Macquarie Arc. It's got a history of extension, which is a thing which you get at least late in the Macquarie Arc. There's a lot of similarities. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't get to drill it. We never got there. Uh, one of the questions that which would be really useful for me to know is has that high potassium signature of the rear arc been a long-standing feature of the Isobonin arc or is it relatively recent? And that's what we were trying to test. And unfortunately, we drilled through 1,300 metres of mud that was supposed to be entirely volcanics because um, they basically misread the seismics. <laughs> they misinterpreted them by what it comes down to. Not, not their fault, but they didn't get it right. So we drilled through a whole lot of mud. We eventually hit volcanics. Things then got really tough. We had to put casing on the hole. We pulled out, put casing in. They probably left it a bit late, put casing in. They put in 1,100 metres of casing, which was every bit of casing on the Geordie's resolution. They put on casing that had never been moved since the ship was first converted to scientific work. It was really rusty. Put it all down there, went back in to drill, started drilling. It's looking great. We're going to get to the, the Eocene, uh, Oligocene basement real soon, we thought. Pulled out and changed the bit, and the camera cable snapped, and we couldn't go back in. So we never got there. That hole is sitting there. If, you, if any of you have any influence with the International Ocean Drilling Community, get them to go back there. There is a well-conditioned hole that would tell us a huge amount about the long-term history of arcs and how they make continental crust and would tell us wonderful things about the Macquarie Arc by analogy and uh, we never, never got into it. It was really annoying. A time for the future. Um, yep. Rob Houston asks a question. Oh, okay. Uh, excuse if this is a naive question, but as well as the arc tectonic drives you described, are there possibilities for complications or evidence for hotspot magmatic intrusions under the influence of continental drift in the more yep. recent tertiary? Quite right. And I think you see them particularly in uh, the MT. Uh, and I, I imagine Alison will probably talk about this in her talk. Uh, you can see features there. You, you can actually track some of the hotspot trails that come up. Uh, but none of them sort of go neatly just under the Macquarie Arc. <laughs> So I don't think you can put it down to a say, temperature effect from those. You can in places. I mean, there's, you see that down in Victoria under the newer volcanics. Uh, you see, uh, I've forgotten the name of the, the Cos Cosgrave Trail. I've forgotten the name now, but there's a, there's a trail of, of um, alkaline volcanics associated with the hotspot. And you can see that, that the MT picks out that up nicely. So that's there, but the really close associate, and it's actually true, if you heated the crust up, you'd also potentially raise it above the uh, Curie temperature so you'd lose the magnetic signature as well. But the fact that it corresponds so nicely with the belt of outcrop in the Macquarie Arc, it, it stops right where the Macquarie Arc stops. Um, I think, no, nah, that'd be really unfortunate for me if it were the case, the unfortunate coincidence. So I'm a lucky fellow, so I don't think that's true. Um, now Dave Arnett has a perfectly good question, but you answered it already, but he says, great talk, Bob. Um, and I think I'll let Steph take over for the last couple of questions. Okay. Yeah. Um, yep. So Richard asks, you should look at the neodymium and hafnium maps for New South Wales too. Yep. I have. Um, <laughs> <laughs> from memory, what are you saying matches the work? This day? Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> Read the paper when I eventually write this. I will work that in as well. There's just so much geochemistry I can manage though. And I'm, I'm so likely to stuff it up. I try and stay away from it a little bit, but you, you're quite right. Um, and then another question from Henry. Um, please um, explain the Lachlan transverse zone. Is it oh. open or is it, or are there other cross arc structures too? There may be other ones. The, the Lachlan transverse zone originally, I mean, it was picked up from the fact that you you literally see a change in strike of of cleavages and things. So, and it cuts across a bit of an angle, and it happens to be where you get lots of the porphyries. It, it seems to have a real significance. What it is has been a matter of debate. I know um, uh, uh, John Greenfield in particular ha is very keen on having um, uh, a substrate structure, which I agree, I think there is a substrate structure. He would probably want to propagate it all the way over from Kernamona. I'm not so keen on that because I think everything else has been too mobile for that to survive. I think if there is an alignment there, it's, well, I don't know. There might be something real. 
But locally within the Macquarie Arc, I, I used to be dubious of this structure because while you could map something there, nothing in the geophysics ever seemed to image it. And then out came firstly the OSREM data and then later, because most recently the OSLAMP, and it's there. So it's a, it's a cross-strike structure, I would say, within that underlying Cambrian arc. And in the case of the Izubonan arc, now this gets into real interesting stuff, which I don't have time for, but the Izubonan arc has these cross-arc transverse sets of volcanoes. And they thought that one of the explanations for that is that they are rolls, they are um, soliton rolls in convection systems within the mantle, the stenospheric wedge over the subducting plate. So you get these little rolling systems and these cross arc structures actually trace those out. So you get chains of volcanoes along those. Um, my um, uh, Yoshihisa Tamura, who was my co-chief and uh, a mate in Japan, is the uh, the big gun on that stuff. So he'd be the person to talk about. But whatever it is, I think it is in fact a structure in that Cambrian arc, which isn't directly present in the modern, in the, pick one modern, Ordovician. Ordovician's modern, right? They had fish. It's relatively modern. No, no, it's only that fish. So we're on the way to having fish anyway. Um, but the Ordovician arc inherited that structure. So it's, it's, it's a lump, probably. It's causing the uh, things to bend around it. And it's hence, uh, probably because you, you're opening gaps up, it's allowing the porphyries to come up. And so that's why you've got all those lovely copper gold porphyries in that system. All right. Thank you, Bob. Um, I think that's the last of the questions. So thank you, everyone, for listening to Bob's talk. And thank you, Bob, for a very enlightening talk. I shall Thanks let Mark. you get out of your warm room. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> everyone thank you to everyone. Stay COVID free. Stay COVID free, yes. I yeah. hope you've all got well stocked fridges. All right. I'm going to hit the button that says disconnect, everyone. Good night. <laughs> well, Good morning, just, just if that's where you are. Screen looks. I was looking at myself on the screen. I said I have a terribly red nose. Oh, well, here and I'm warm, I guess. All right. See you all. <laughs>